This is a nutmeg. If I grate it and consume more than a few grams of it, I'm likely to get high. This is because nutmeg contains a molecule called myristicin that, if it gets into your brain, is a precursor molecule for something similar to the drug ecstasy. But before you run off to get high on nutmeg, let me also warn you that just a little bit more might make you terribly sick because it is also quite toxic. Let's take another example. Cloves. Eugenol. The flavor molecule essential oil in clove is also quite toxic. In small amounts, it's a painkiller and we've all used it to numb a toothache and also keep cavities away since it is also strongly antimicrobial. But too much will make you sick. In fact, many countries have pages dedicated to what to do if you overdose on cloves. So there is a pattern here. Spices seem to want to harm us. But if you understand how spices came to exist in the first place, you'd understand and forgive plants for it. In my video on onion and garlic, I had explained why plants don't move. Well, technically they do, but they do it very slowly over a long period of time, so we don't notice it. But anyway, quick summary. Photosynthesis used to be very efficient at converting the sun's energy into the energy inside glucose molecules that plants make, but as oxygen levels increased in our atmosphere, that slowed photosynthesis down. Essentially, the greatest benefit plants do for animal life on Earth, which is producing oxygen for them to breathe, is not actually great for them. But of course, they adapted, as all life does. They were like, if I can't move, I will sit tight and invest all my resources in building the world's most advanced biological weapons lab and synthesize a range of chemicals to irritate, incapacitate, and sometimes kill. So plants sat around and over hundreds of millions of years evolved some of the most unique chemical defense systems you can imagine. I've already spoken about two of them. Onion, that uses an enzyme to make a molecule that breaks down into dilute sulfuric acid in your eye. And chilies, that make a molecule called capsaicin, that fools your brain into thinking that your mouth is literally on fire. In this video, we will explore the rest of that insane chemical creativity that plants exhibit. Creativity that we homo sapiens have learned to exploit to get spices. <music> Let's take a slight tangent here. Sometimes people ask me, what makes Indian food Indian? And this is a hard question. The flavor of food varies every 100 kilometers in this part of the world. It also varies by caste, economic class, and religion. As I was writing Masala Lab, thinking about the better patterns that define cooking in different parts of the world, it struck me that the most universally acceptable generalization of cuisine of South Asia, that's actually all the way from Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, is that almost always, dishes tend to begin with hot oil of some kind and whole spices. So, in effect, the concept of tadka, chonk, talip, at the start and end of a dish, defines the fundamental flavor of a specific region. Let's take some examples. If you start with coconut oil and add cumin, mustard, curry leaves, garlic, and chilies, it will taste like a Kerala dish no matter what you do after that. On the other hand, if you start with mustard oil, add mustard, fenugreek, celery seed, nigella, and fennel, it will taste Bengali no matter what comes afterwards. Which brings us back to the topic of our video, the spices. So going back to plants wanting to defend themselves and producing chemical weapons, spice molecules tend to have two features. One, they're volatile, meaning that they will move through the air and hurt bacteria, insects, and any animal that wants to eat the plant. This is why spices have very strong smells. Two, fat soluble. If they were water soluble, the plant would lose a lot of this precious hard to manufacture stuff every day because water is moving inside a plant all the time. But human beings do something that animals don't. We 
cook our food. The act of applying heat denatures most of the nastiest effects of some of these molecules and tames them down from volatile and poisonous to aromatic and healthy. Cooking is why spices exist. In the absence of cooking, they are just plant defense chemicals that the animal kingdom cannot tolerate. And the act of heating oil and then adding these spices dissolves the most aromatic and flavorful molecules into the fat so that they are not lost to the air because they are volatile. And over thousands of years, people in this part of the world have found just the right trees, herbs and fruits that are pleasant smelling and beneficial without being too poisonous. For instance, if you remember this from Breaking Bad, the castor bean from where we get castor oil is also used to make a poison called ricin. About 100 micrograms of ricin can kill you because it stops protein synthesis inside cells, causing them to die rapidly. The plant kingdom has had millions of years to produce some of the most dangerous toxins on the planet to keep animals like you and me from eating them. So remember this, if you randomly pick some berries in the forest and try to eat them, there's a good chance that it will make you very sick. Our human ancestors have domesticated a small number of plants to be less toxic and more edible, so stick to them. But from the ones human beings have selected over thousands of years, many of those spice flavor molecules, we call them phytochemicals, literally meaning chemicals from plants, are actually beneficial in small quantities. They are antimicrobial, so spicy food does not spoil very soon, and antioxidants. They delay cancers by preventing reactions in your body that increase the risk of cancer. So that's how spices came to exist. Now let's understand the various families of aromatic molecules that give spices their unique flavors. <music> While actual flavor scientists will use a more complex categorization, we will keep things simple. Purely from the point of view of someone in the home kitchen looking to create an interesting mix of spices that makes our food delicious. Most Indian spice flavors come in seven categories. Please note that every spice will be made from a mix of these, with some of them dominating more than others. Phenols, where an OH group is attached to an aromatic hydrocarbon group, like eugenol in cloves. In fact, all flavor molecules ending in all are likely to be phenols. Terpenes. This is a very large category. Citrusy flavors like limonene in coriander, earthy flavors like cumin and nigella, warming flavors like nutmeg or mace, and penetrating flavors like cardamom. Acids. These lend a sour taste, like citric acid in citrus fruits or malic acid in raw mango powder. Aldehydes with a CHO group, like cinnamaldehyde in cinnamon and cuminaldehyde in cumin. Sulfur-based and meaty, like allicin in garlic, phenyl ethane thiol in curry leaf, and various sulfides in asafoetida. Hing. Pungent, like capsaicin in chilies, gingerol in ginger, piperine in pepper, and allyl isothiocyanate in mustard or wasabi. Complex, where a mix of molecules give the spice a very complex, unique, and hard to categorize flavor, like saffron or fenugreek. In my book, Masala Lab, you can also see a table that tells you which spices go well with others, based on the fact that many share the same flavor molecules. This is not surprising because the defense chemicals plants produce likely go back to a simpler common ancestor. So many spices often use the same building blocks, but adjusted for local conditions and specific enemies. Individual regions in India have concocted specific spice mixes that uniquely identify the food from that place. Let's see some of the most common examples. Garam masala, bhaja moshla, fish masala, chetinad chicken masala, goda masala. So now that we've understood the biology and chemistry of spices, let's get to the kitchen and see how to best store them 
and use them. Whole spices last much longer than powdered spices, but even they lose aroma over time. So I would store the cheaper ones, cumin, mustard, coriander, pepper, fenugreek, etc., in airtight containers, but store the expensive, more flavor dense ones like cardamom, clove, mace, nutmeg, cinnamon, etc., in the freezer. Powdered spices I always store in the freezer, with the exception of turmeric and chili powder. This is because powdered spices lose aroma very quickly at room temperature, particularly in a hot place like India. I also suggest buying a small coffee grinder and using it for spices. That way, you can buy whole spices and make spice mixes whenever you want and in the amounts you need. And when using them, remember this, spice flavors are fat soluble. What you add at the start to your hot oil is going to define the bulk of the flavor of your dish. When you add powders, the earlier you add them to the dish, the milder they will taste at the end. So if you want a stronger flavor, add powders towards the end. This is why purely aromatic finishing spices like garam masala or herbs like kasuri methi are added towards the end. You can also adjust amounts. A small amount of spice powder towards the end is similar to a larger amount added earlier. And finally, let's address some common myths and pseudoscience about spices. There is a lot of social media content or WhatsApp forwards about how specific spices are magical cures for illnesses. That's not how it works. Spices have beneficial molecules that are antioxidants and antimicrobial. And when consumed in moderate amounts as part of a healthy meal and lifestyle, they are excellent for you. But they are not medicines. By themselves, there is no peer-reviewed double-blind evidence that they can cure or reverse any specific disease by themselves. Drinking lots of turmeric milk or any unnaturally large amounts of spices is not going to help. If anything, it could damage your liver. Let's end with where we started out, nutmeg. The spice that can make you high, can put babies to sleep, can make you really sick depending on how much you eat. In the 1600s, the British and Dutch fought a war over the control of the only place on earth where nutmeg trees grew. This is in the spice islands of what is today Indonesia. And the Dutch finally gained control by exchanging a small marshy island they controlled in North America with the British. That island was Manhattan, which went on to become New York City. And the Dutch, they also failed to control the nutmeg trade. And the Dutch eventually did not get a monopoly over nutmeg either because the British managed to grow them in the Caribbean and in Kerala. 